This next gentleman, you may wonder when he comes up on stage why he's not the biggest guy in the room. One reason may be he's the youngest of ten brothers. Marshall Damgard told me that probably meant that he didn't get much to eat at the dinner table, but he sure as hell learned how to run. <laughs> For three generations, his family's worked the land. In fact, he and his family, on many occasions, have custom combined in South Dakota. He has spoken all across America on agriculture economics. And even people that violently disagree with him say that he has absolute personal integrity. This is a gentleman who calls it the way he sees it. He's associated with the LFG company as the vice president, a senior vice president, and a market analyst from Englewood, Colorado, Andy Gottschalk. Andy? Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> You'll never see two speakers more polar opposite than myself and the one you just heard. We're going to get after this. There's a lot to learn. There are people in this world, <clears throat> when Edison invented the light bulb, who went around the world and cried wolf that the family of candle makers was going to be put out of existence. I'm not part of that group. I'm part of that group that looked at that light and figured out ways to use it and saw that light and moved forward. So keep that in the context when I speak, understand where I'm coming from. We're in a rapidly moving economy, a global economy, and you have a choice to either move forward or move backward. If you move backward, you're out. If I had to address this to anyone, it's for the young people. I have children, the age of some of the children I met last night, and I want to thank the governor for allowing that opportunity. There has never been a greater opportunity for you today ever than exists today for young people. Don't laugh. It has never been greater. The opportunity to educate yourself and the correlation between education and income has never been greater. And it's going to happen on a global basis at a rate that we can't even imagine. And it bodes well for agriculture if we can be competitive. And we can be. We're going to try and dispel some myths about the market. And first of all, I'm going to focus on the cattle cycle itself to dispel the myths that this one was different when, in fact, if it was any more the same, I wouldn't have a job. If we look at the green bars, please note they represent the build-up years in the cattle cycle, which run six to seven years. They're then followed by liquidation years. This goes back into the 1920s, which last two to four years. This build-up started in 1990 at about 95 million head, lasted six years, inventories built to 103.8 million, and we are now in the liquidation phase. It is no different than what we've had in the past. The one exception to that was the Hillary rally in 1979 and 80. I see no one, I didn't hear any rocks hit the stadium when I said that, so I have another one I can pass on to you about the Clintons. 
I've been speaking a lot, and I was down at the University of Missouri recently speaking, and I said, you know, I decided to drive, and I said, Lyman's about 70 miles outside of Denver. And I said, when I got to Lyman, the highway was already beginning to remind me about Bill Clinton. He's a little crooked, little slick, and a little yellow down the middle. <laughs> Can you imagine? how long that trip was from Lyman to Columbia, Missouri. <laughs> anyway, let's look at prices. Many of you have heard falsely that prices in this cycle were different. They're no different. In fact, they're almost identical. With the exception of the worst period we ever had was the 1950s drought. In that period, fat cattle prices declined 52% from their monthly high in the cycle to their monthly low. Since then, as you can see, price, the price uh, declines in cycle since then have averaged 31%. The decline in this cycle, the high was in March of 1993, the low in April of 1996. The decline from high to low was 29%. It was no different. It was right in line with previous cycles. Interestingly, I don't know if there are any bankers here, but I know I got a lot of calls for this chart after I addressed the North American Agricultural Conference and the South Dakota Bankers Association. Interestingly, if you take a look at this chart, please note the red line. I have a drought cycle imposed over the bottom that hits about every 20 years. I suppose concentration had something to do with that for captive supply. Hell, we've got to blame somebody. The drought cycle hits every 20 to 22 years, and unfortunately, it tends to impact cattle prices in the odd decades. I went through the 50s, I remember it. I was very young, but I remember. Most of you people remember the 70s, record high grain prices and a collapse in cattle prices. The 90s, odd decade, record high grain prices, a collapse in cattle prices. Maybe Mother Nature has something to do with this. Maybe it's not all predatory. Just maybe. It's not a laughing matter. That's the real world. Real world's a little bit tougher to handle. What happens when we move into liquidation and we have drought? Well, cow slaughter goes up. You run out of feed, cow slaughter goes up, and we add to production. Please note that cow slaughter had been historically low, averaging about 6 million head a year. And this year will increase in excess of 1 million head to about 7.3 million. That adds to meat production, and as a consequence, prices are driven lower. There are a couple of other examples I want to throw up here rather quickly, because I think they tell us something about our industry, and they also tell us something about the benefits of size. <clears throat> I have up in front of you the ratio of feeder cattle prices to the price of fed cattle. And I want you to note the trend, which is the drought trend. I connected the low points, the 1950s drought, the 1970s drought. You might uh, remind yourself that it was in the late 60s and 70s that the commercial feeding industry really exploded in the southern, throughout the southern plains. There were a lot of new facilities, not a lot of equity build up yet, and when the crunch hit, a lot of those people went out of business. Feed yards changed hands, many of them two or three times. Please note in this last cycle, with the highest grain prices we've ever had, that feeder cattle prices held at 5% uh, discount to the price of feeders, to the price of fed cattle, but held well above the drought trend line. You want to take a guess as to why that might have happened? We had fewer, but bigger and better financed feed yards. The feeding industry had the staying power to support that feeder cattle market because many of the biggest feed yards are driven by maintaining and running those yards at the highest utilization rates possible. And that created demand for feeder cattle and kept feeder cattle from breaking 
to what should have been lows which were consistent with past drought cycles. Big is not always bad. In fact, big can create a lot of competition. People get confused and think competition is a multitude of buyers. I submit to you it's not a multitude of buyers at all. Buyers that have no money or no staying power don't create a lot of competition. And I want to make a case in point. It's the last section of land I bought in the mid-80s in the farm crisis. How many people showed up at the farm auctions? Take a guess. You remember the TV pictures? 50, 100, 200? There are a lot of people ran up the donut and coffee bill. They didn't have the money to buy and land values went down. What you need for competition is two people who need the same item and have a lot of money. That creates competition. If you have three, that's better. If you have four, that's fantastic. If you have five or six, it's even better. But the key that drives competition is the ability to have the money to finance it. And the reason we don't have 30 or 40 Packers today is when times got tough, they simply didn't have the bucks to stand in there and compete. And if you think you had higher prices as a result of those Packers, you're kidding yourself. If you think land prices were higher in the mid-80s because you had 200 people out at an auction as opposed to two that had money, think again. We get confused with the facts real easily. We laugh at things. I heard some chuckles before because there was a few comments made that I knew you wanted to hear. Doesn't mean they're right. We'll have an opportunity to debate that a little bit later. Let's take a look at the ratio of cow prices to Fed steer prices. Drought cycles, 50s, 70s, and here we are again. Concentration didn't have a thing to do with that. Captive supply didn't have a thing to do with that. Mother Nature had something to do with that. I want to know where all these hotshot experts were up here that just surface at the bottom of cattle cycles and have all the damn answers. They even raise a good question once in a while. Sad part is they do not answer it. Where were they? I know where I was. I know very clearly where I was. So don't say these things aren't predictable. Don't say they're manipulated. They happen over time. And if you keep yourself informed, you can benefit from it. You can keep yourself from this disaster. I'm going to look a little bit at the retailer, because the retailer catches a lot of hell that he doesn't deserve. We look at a farm to uh, retail spread and people don't even know what they're analyzing, they draw false conclusions. We'll talk about that later. I want to show you a recent ad in Denver. Kathleen said ground beef was $1.89. Well, she should move into Denver. You can buy ground beef at 79 to 89 cents any day. Any day. These ads are running almost constantly. Top sirloin, $2.99. Bottom round roast, $1.49. New York strips, $2.99. You don't see it here. Earlier, the governor mentioned that if you put all the people together, you'd only be the 59th largest uh, community in the nation. This isn't where the advertising bucks go. They go into the big cities where there's the large populace, and that's where you see the beef features. And make no mistake about it, you better thank the retailer for what they did and the amount of product they shoved through the system. And before I leave this part of it, I want to ask you a question. 
Does this beef industry have a written contract with the retailer to sell any of your product? Someone can answer that right now. Do they have a contract? They don't have any contract. You're lucky I don't run one of those damn stores. <laughs> First time you threaten to sue me, I'd call them the red meat buyers in and they would all become chicken buyers. <laughs> those guys are too easy on you. They forget to remind you that we have no contract. They have no contract with a packer. They have no contract with you. You have no idea what those people do to try and sell your product, and all we have is these few self-appointed, self-anointed experts who pop up occasionally and want to lay blame. Why don't they try and get in a business? With the last retailer I met, they operated, operated on a point oh oh four six operating margin. Try it. See if it's not competitive. We say the retail price does not follow the live price. The NCBA tracks the featured retail price, which is really the price <clears throat> we want to track. We want to track. Over 50% of beef sold in the United States sells at this price, not the all-choice price. It sells at a 14% discount or 38 to 42 cents a pound less than the all-choice. Wouldn't that alter the farm-to-retail spread dramatically? Wouldn't that change that phony graph just a little bit? Now we also have people say that supply and demand doesn't work. Well, you all can read these graphs. They're in color so you can separate what's happening very easily. In the red years, we're looking at production. Anytime you're above zero, production is up. Anytime you're below zero, production is down. Please note that with the exception of two little periods up there, anytime production is above zero, the green bar, which is the price, is down. Price is moving opposite the trend in production. That's supply and demand at work. It works every day. It's worked in the past. And it'll work in the future. This is really what it looks like. When we look at total demand, <clears throat> demand is a function of total supply plus imports minus exports. And on this, we're looking at uh, that supply figure against price. Fits almost like a glove, but some people say supply and demand don't work. The reason we can forecast prices is if we can forecast the production level, we can nail the price. <clears throat> 1996, we're going to produce about 25.5 billion pounds of beef. We are going to read on this trend, and that'll be about $64.5. Across the bottom, please note production. And as prices came down along this trend, on this scale, production increased from the early 90s, from 23 billion pounds to the 25.5 this year. Please note from this graph that in these three years, 89, 92, and 93, production was fairly constant at about 23 billion pounds, and there was very little variation in price. Pretty hard to argue that supply and demand don't work. Now, as we reduce the supply, prices will start to climb up this scale. Now let's look at the total cattle inventory. Facts and myths. People talk about the total cattle inventory. Total cattle inventory peaked in 1975 at 132 million. We liquidated, built the herd back up, 
1982, 115 million, and we started to liquidate down to 95 million in 1990, and since then have built to 103.8 million. And people look at this graph and say, my, since cattle numbers have gone down and prices are down, there must be manipulation or it's due to concentration. Not so. I'm glad Kathleen brought you the bad news. Because I get asked this when I throw this up. And I said, let's look at the average dress weights. From 1975 they, uh, to uh, the present time, they increased 20.3%, while inventories declined 21.4%. Weights offset the increase or the reduction in inventories. If we look at production per cow unit, not adjusted for imports, it increased 37 percent, while the cattle, uh, cow inventories declined uh, 21 percent. Using Kathleen's figures of a 23 percent increase, including imports, the figure was 23 percent, correct, Kathleen? You said 23? That was the number. I wrote it down. <laughs> it still more than offset the reduction in inventories. It's the real world. What does that weight do? 1982 was our last peak in cattle inventories at 115 million. I went and I adjusted the gain in weight to the inventory. The gain in weight since 1982 is, was the equivalent of adding 12 million head of cattle to our inventory. Isn't it ironic that the last time we hit 115 million, we liquidated, and here we are again on a production capability basis? You people should get credit for some of the efficiencies. Is there anyone in this room that is weaning cattle at lighter weights than they did five years ago. Not due to weather. <laughs> Ten years ago. Lighter cattle, I don't see any hands. You know why? They're out of business. They're gone. They just didn't stay up. They weren't efficient enough. So you deserve some of the credit, not all of it. As Kathleen mentioned, some of this weight is attributable to imports, but I'm going to analyze that too a little bit later, a little bit more in detail. <clears throat> let's get off the supply side and let's take a look at demand. I hope there are some economic students here. If we look at the 1970s, it was the last of the golden years for the beef industry. For decades, the beef industry was the beneficiary of a, of a stable or rising demand structure. In 1979, prior to the advent of captive supply, the demand side of this market started to erode. I believe I was the first to recognize it in the spring of 79, and we have never stopped warning the industry about it. It has been in a precipitous decline ever since. And let me explain the graph. Each little dot represents per capita consumption, which is a function of total production plus imports. See, we're always going to consume all of that. The real question is, at what price? You can't just throw a chart up and sh say production and consumption without looking at price. Hell, you've only looked at half the equation. You know what kind of answer you come up with? Half. You know what. OK, same demand curve. From 1979 through 1986, notice that per capita supply varied by less than about a pound and a half. But it took a lower and lower retail price to drive it through the system. 
where this industry really missed the golden opportunity was coming out of the 1986 liquidation in the bull market. When prices started to rise and exports started to go up with it, you equated the rising price structure to an improving demand structure, when in effect it wasn't happening. I wasn't very popular while the market was going up because the answer question always was, well, if prices, if demand's no good, how are prices going up? I said, we're simply cutting supply. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that if we have to continually cut supply to raise price, it's just a matter of time and half of you people are out of business. And every time we cut supply, we concede market share and we lose bargaining power with the consumer. So here are the 80s, the bull market. Per capita supplies were cut from 77 pounds down to 67. And we were able to consume that in the system at the retail level, adjusted for inflation at a steady price. There was no secret when we observed this. I talked to a number of my clients when we saw the market top in late 1990 and the spring of 1991. I said, the minute production starts to rise, prices are just going to collapse. The demand base isn't there to support it, and it's going to drive the price structure straight down. Well, guess what happened? That's the result of declining demand. Now, let's look at an industry that's experiencing better demand, especially from this period on. Please note that since 1991, the broiler industry has expanded per capita consumption from 63 pounds to 75 pounds. And they've done that at essentially the same price. That's rising demand. If you can consume more every day at the same price, that's rising demand. That is the exact opposite of what happened to beef. There's brawlers on this graph, and there's beef. We were consuming less at the same price in the 80s. If we're to make comparable uh, comparisons to periods that might be somewhat similar in terms of how they're presented on the graph, the only difference is they're moving in opposite directions. One is improving demand, one is declining demand. And it's obvious which one is declining demand. Let's take a look at the structure. I find it interesting when people talk about beef, and they fail to talk about the total meat complex. It's as if we operate in a glass bubble. It's as if we have no competition. That would be nice. Unfortunately, that's not the real world. Let's take a look. Imprint this in your mind. That is the world you compete in every day, and you are the red portion of that world. You are producing no more product today than you did in 1976. Production has increased the last number of years because of the growth in inventory. You are going to produce this year's production with 25 million fewer cattle. You're going to produce the same amount of beef as we did in 1976. Please note that since 1976, everything above this line is the competition. All the green is the competition, but all the growth in, the comp uh, the growth in total meat supplies since 1976 has gone to the competition. 
What does that mean? That means we're a smaller piece of the pie. This is what it looks like when you break it down. You can see beef. I have green for broilers because it either says go or represents dollars, and I'll get to that later. Pork and turkey, you can see what's happening. But there is one chart up there, line that should really get your attention, and that's the broiler industry. And I find it ironic that they're more vertically integrated than we are. They're more innovative in product development. They have lower costs. And if I was to listen to the previous speakers, hell, that shouldn't be happening. Shouldn't be happening, but it is. The benefits of vertical integration and size and deep pockets. I was at a meeting recently, and I was told by a supermarket, uh, he was the head meat buyer for a major chain, he said there were 43,000 food items developed last year alone. Only a couple hundred of those were beef. I was enamored at the chart that Professor Heffernan showed, all the variety of foods that ConAgra has had up there. Took a lot of money to develop that. That just didn't happen on its own. Took deep pockets. Well, anyway, when we look at meat production, the essence of what is happening is in this graph. The top line represents beef production. The market share that we had two decades ago, we were 53%, and now we are 34. And we are truly at a crossroad against the broiler industry. We are truly at a crossroad. What happens when we put population against this? Well, this is what it amounts to. Per capita consumption of beef has declined 15% in the last 10 years. It's declined 24% in the last 20 years. And you can see what the competing meats have done. The decline in per capita consumption since 1985 is equivalent to eliminating the populations of Texas, New York, our second and third largest populated states, and the state of Arizona. Or it is the same as the entire population gained since 1978, no longer eating beef. Now, we can stick our head in the sand and say, this isn't happening. But I believe you people are going to be a lot more honest with yourselves. You see it every day around you. You see it at your meals. You see it when you go into the restaurants and order. Every day, it's around you. What are consumers eating? They're con since 1970, compared to 1994, and the latest data is available, they're consuming 63 pounds more vegetables, 49 pounds more fruit, 63 pounds more grain products. That means pastas. I noticed what they had in the, in the salad out there today was pasta within the salad. 31 pounds more poultry and 16.7 pounds less red meat, mostly beef. I know there are some people in here that are still in college, and probably the most important number they're interested in is beer consumption. <laughs> it's up four gallons. Take a look at world meat production. Beef, here, 76, 96 is in the green, 91, 
is in the red. On a world basis, red uh, beef production is hardly increased. Pork production, as you can see, is increasing, and poultry production is climbing rapidly. Let's take a look at per capita consumption in the top 10 consuming countries for each product. Beef consumption is down 20% in the top 10 beef consuming countries. In the top 10 pork consuming countries, pork consumption is up 33%, and in poultry, it's up 87%. So please understand that the challenge is global. I want to take a minute to look at imports versus exports. Everything's converted to a pound equivalent. The green line represents exports. The red line represents imports, inclusive of cattle, converted to pounds of production. And the black line represents the net of the two. 1990, we had the highest cattle prices ever. We averaged $78, and I believe 58 cents in western Kansas. That's the year of the highest net imports. In 1993, we had $85 fat cattle, and that is the year of the second highest net imports. Since 1993, net imports have declined dramatically. would be hard to blame imports for the price pressure the last few years. I've taken this one step farther. I've taken it a couple steps. I superimposed price over this. This chart's going to be a little bit tough to follow, but stick with me. The red bar represents total imports. The blue bar represents domestic production, and the green line represents price. What I did is I went back and analyzed the change in imports and the change in production, and plotted the changes against one another. Please note <clears throat> that when the blue, which is domestic production, is above the line, above the line, domestic production rising, prices are down. Imports were also up this year. Domestic production dropped, prices went up. Domestic production dropped, imports went up, prices went up. Domestic production dropped, imports dropped, prices went up. Domestic production dropped, imports went up dramatically, and prices went up. Domestic production trends drive the price structure. Now, let's take a look at the latter part of the chart. We'll just step along in time here. Notice when there weren't any dramatic changes in production and price, or production, imports or exports. Domestic production was pretty stable here. Prices were fairly stable. And then domestic production took off. And consistent, when production took off, prices went down. Net domestic uh, imports will decline this year. The net figure will decline, be a net reduction from last year. Domestic production up, prices down. It's pretty hard to build a case that imports drive the price structure. Not when you look at the total picture. 
The thing that's forgotten in terms of the import-export, and this is what it really boils down to, is that is the trade balance. This industry runs a $2.3 billion trade surplus inclusive of the value of live cattle imports and exports. Through May, we ran a billion dollar trade surplus. We don't want to forget the most important part when we look at exports. Please note that exports are a very small piece of the pie. This is the U.S. consumer. That is the largest component of demand for your product. Now let's look at what the consumer is doing. We have some areas to debate some of the issues that have been discussed here today. There's some legitimate area for debate. But if the consumer isn't willing to buy your product, there isn't any debate. It's over. So let's take a look at what the consumer is doing. Consumer spending for red meat and poultry, 1975 to 80, increased $92 during that five-year period, $92 per person. Beef captured $45 or 49% of the new spending. 75 to 80. Remember in the earlier chart, when I had the chart and the demand for the 70s, I said that was the last of the golden years. In the five-year period prior to that, beef captured 67% of all new spending for red meat and poultry. Since then, since 1980, 10%, 10%, 10%. The competition, 90%. If you don't have new money coming in, you can't grow an industry. You simply can't. I don't care who you are. You cannot grow an industry unless you have new money coming in. And the consumer is not buying your product. When I look at the spending flows, this is what they look like. Is there any secret why the brawler industry is growing? Because the consumer is spending their money on their product. That is what is financing the expansion. Do you want to know why the beef industry has been stagnant in its total production level for the last two decades? Because there's no new money coming in from the consumer. You produce nothing of value unless the consumer determines it has value. There is a tremendous misconception in this industry that a packer determines the price or a retailer. You think they determine the price? Go out and open one up. See how long you survive. Mr. Peterson was here this morning, and I'm certain that if he could just go in and raise the price of their end product, he would do so immediately to their sales staff. But the reason he can't is there's a retailer he has to sell it to, and that retailer has to sell it to a consumer. I suppose in someone's wisdom, someone will figure out, maybe we could sue the consumer. I mean, hell, we sue everybody else. The only problem is, Think of the jury you may get. <laughs> this is all going to boil down to the consumer and what we have to do. In terms of consumer spending, we've lost market share too. I want to show you, demonstrate how easily it is to be misled and this happened to take place here in the state of South Dakota when I addressed, I believe it was South Dakota Cattlemen's asked me to come in. And the luncheon speaker got up and did a real nice job 
didn't have all his facts straight, and therefore you were confused. And he said, beef's getting 50% of the consumer dollar. And I looked around and I saw some smiles, like, boy, we got them. And he said, I cheer every time I go by McDonald's. And then I got up and I had to deliver the bad news. I said, uh, you only got part of the story. I said, first of all, beef isn't getting 50% of the dollar, it's getting 46 and a half. The real story is you used to get 61 and a half percent of the consumer dollar for red meat and poultry. That's the real story. And God bless McDonald's for what they've done, but I cry when I go by McDonald's. And I do so for one reason. 43 to 45 percent of our product is in the form of ground or processed beef, and it's simply doesn't represent the same value to the consumer as the middle meats. And if we're going to produce for a hamburger society, half of you people are out of business. We have to figure out how to take, especially the front third of that carcass, and add value to it. We have tremendous demand for the middle meats. And that's why steaks in the restaurant didn't get cheaper when cattle got cheaper, because there's such strong demand. And it's a clue as to what we can do and how we can help ourselves. But we've got to add value to the front third of the carcass. Hell, and the back third, too. And we have to start today. We have to make that chuck fly just like the wing from that chicken that used to sell at 19 cents a pound, and now they get 229. What does this mean, the lost market share, the lost spending mean to you? It cost this industry $8.7 billion last year compared to what consumers were spending in 1985, or about $84 per head for any, animal, any live animal in the inventory. That would have put virtually every operator here in the black last year. But that's not the real cost. The real cost of declining market share is that beef prices will increasingly be influenced by the production and price level of the competing meats. You will lose space at the retail counter. You will lose space on the menus. And as such, the consumer has in more and more alternatives to your product. And when that happens, and as that happens, you lose bargaining power. That's the real cost. That's why the number one priority for this industry is to reverse this trend in market share. We can debate about some of the other things. I'm not going to waste a lot of time debating, but we can debate a little bit. But if you did all the things some of these people wanted to do, it would not bring one consumer back to the marketplace. Not one. And you say, well, how would you know that, Andy? Well, on Saturdays, when I have time, I go down to King Supers, which is a division of Kroger's, Safeways and Albertsons, three superb supermarkets. And they sell beef, believe me. They do a good job. And I listen to what the consumer says. And what the consumer says repeatedly is, well, I don't eat beef. I can just buy this amount because it's too expensive. Last piece of meat I had wasn't too good. Not once do I hear them talk about concentration. Not once do I hear them talk about captive supply. Not once do I hear them talk about cattle on feed. Quite simply, they don't know and they don't care. What they do care about is what value beef represents to them relative to the competing meats. That is all they care about. In those industries which are more vertically integrated than we are, are providing more product at lower prices, lower relative prices, than our industry is, and they're just flat kicking our behind. That is the real world we live in.
How do we attack this? Price, quality, convenience, and consistency. What all this boils down to is one word, value. How, we, how effective we are in attacking those issues and moving those to the consumer front will determine how successful this industry is going to be in the future. I'm going to close with a picture of the past, a picture of where we are today, and the future of this industry if we don't change our course of action. I have tremendous confidence in people in this industry that if they're given the correct information, they will move forward and make the right decisions. I have tried my best to give you as much information as I could to formulate opinions that will help you understand the problem in the time that I've had allocated. I know when we look at this and I go over these things, <clears throat> it has sort of a negative connotation and I don't want to leave with that. I'm extremely optimistic about this industry because of some things that I see. I'm very disappointed in others. But so there's no confusion. You probably won't remember the facts, but you have a pretty good memory for jokes. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> Dr. Heffernan, in your department, is there anyone studying the memory capability of the human being that's not in your field? I thought somewhere along the line it might, because all they have to do is look at the cattle industry. It's something more than eight and something less than nine years. And someone says, well, Andy, how do you know that? I said, well, the cattle cycle is 10 to 11 years long, and it's just one year longer than the memory of people in the cattle industry. I'm going to close leaving you with this joke so that you don't confuse my outlook for the future. I believe it is incredibly bright for those people with vision who can seize an opportunity, and I think we are at an opportune moment. So this reminds me of these three bulls out in the pasture. This is an old bull, yeah, middle-aged bull, and this young bull. He's just getting started. They had heard rumors, and the world lives on rumors, you know, that the owner was going to bring in this huge exotic bull. The old bull says, you know, I've worked all my life for my harem, and I'm not going to turn anything loose. And the middle bull said, you know, I'm just getting to where I really enjoy this, and I expect to spread out a little bit, and I'm not going to give up any of my territory. And the little bull, of course, he was real feisty, and he said, you know, I'm getting started, and I'm going to take everything I can get, and then some. So one day this truck comes down this road, and you can imagine. A truck coming down the road, and the sideboards were bulging out like this. It's a huge bull just tearing everything up. Backs up to the chute, and the owner opens a chute, and this huge bull comes down the chute, and he goes right through right through the corrals, and he stands out there in the bottom, the old bulls are up on the hill, and they see this big bull. And that old bull looked at that middle-aged bull, and he said, you know, he said, I really have had a good life. <laughs> and he said, I just want to live a few more years. He said, uh, I can share a little of mine, a few of mine with him. The middle-aged bull said, well, he says, I've done really well, and if I have to backtrack a year, I don't mind. And they looked over, and this little bull had backed himself up against the barn, and he was just pawing away like hell and dust flying all over. And that old bull looked over, it, over at him and said, uh, son, he said, what do you think you're doing? He said, I don't want this guy to confuse me with a heifer. 